Amen. Titus chapter 2. Let's go stand and read the word of the Lord. Give honor to it. We're going to start reading in verse 7. I was going to go from 7 through 10, but I got to realizing there was a shift in subject and and um, probably had written enough, so I just stopped after two verses. Praise God. It's a privilege to be a child of God. It's a privilege to know what we know, experience what we experience. And we thank God for it. Amen. And uh, I make no apologies for the life of holiness. It is a beautiful way. Beautiful way. So tonight we're going to be talking about a pattern of good works. Pattern of good works. So let's start reading in verse 7, chapter 2, verse 7. Paul said, or said to Titus, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. He that, uh, that he that is of the contrary part, and unfortunately there are contrary people out there, may be ashamed having no evil thing to say of you. So we're going to talk about being a pattern of good works. Let's love the Lord. Thank him for his word. Let's ask God to help us tonight in Jesus' name. You're so merciful and kind, God, undeserving of your mercy, undeserving of the long suffering that you have towards us. But, oh, God, we are so grateful. We are, we are so very grateful. And we will be grateful throughout all of eternity because you have supplied and done for us. Pray, God, that you would talk to us. Let the word of the Lord be clear and plain in Jesus' name. And let everybody say amen. 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 God bless you. Thank God. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to be talking about good works tonight as we start this off. Now, one thing we do know is we are not saved by works. Everybody understand that? Say amen. That's, it's not anything that we can do to earn, deserve. We're not pretty enough. We're not handsome enough. We're not rich enough. There's not a thing that we can offer God that God needs other than our hearts and our love and our appreciation. Um, it's, it's like Father's Day is coming up. And if dad controls the checkbook and the pocketbook and earns the money, it's kind of hard sometimes to buy for dad when he goes out and buys for himself. Makes it a challenge. What do we have that we could offer God that God would want? I mean, he could create anything he wants. All he really wants is our love and appreciation, our affection for everything that he has done. And, uh, but yet, in the midst of all of that, we're not, we're not saved by our works. We can't, can't deserve it. But yet, we are admonished still by the word of God to do good works. Just because we are not saved by them does not exclude them from part of our lifestyle, our activity. Jesus uh, talked about this when he talked about hiding your light under a bushel. He talked about a city that is built upon a hill. He said this in Matthew 5 and 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So we don't do it to buy, we don't do it to earn, but we sure do it to make sure the others know that we love God and God is worthy to be served. Amen? So we do it for those things. Now, this is our God-given purpose. God has given us a, a, a bank, blank slate. I've often said it like this. It's not just the man in the pulpit that is the minister of the congregation, but everybody sitting on the pew is a minister as well. We all have a duty and obligation to serve, to give, and to work and do good things. Ephesians 2 and verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. 
So he has created us and he has given us a purpose to do good works, which God hath before ordained, somebody say ordained, that we should walk in them. So before, before there was ever the man Christ Jesus, there was still the ordained plan of God that we should be servants unto him and we should do good works. So we have this obligation. God does not ask us to do a job and not give us the tools to do it with. If he calls you, he will equip you. He will not ask you to do something that is beyond your ability. This question came out on a forum uh, sometime this week about, uh, you know, people are always saying we need, to, we need to do all these things for the poor. Uh, we, the church needs to do more for the poor. First of all, most of the world back then that were poor worked all day long in the fields in order to have enough food to eat by the end of the day. That was the common thing. The, the scripture made sure that there was application so that there was uh, residual benefits that the poor could reap from the corners of the field, not going over it again, not, not going second time over the fruit tree, but once you've done it, that which was not ripe, you leave it for those gleaners that are coming afterwards. But the poor had means work uh, provided for them, but they were still expected to work. Paul said, if you don't work, you shouldn't, you don't have a right to eat. It just goes hand in hand. What we have today and what we refer to as poor many times are two people who are too lazy and selfish to get out and do anything for themselves. And then they manipulate scripture to try to put guilt upon us that we should do more for them. Don't you know God has provided? If people would just take advantage of it, God has provided. And he will, he will make sure that you're taken care of. That's just God's way. Now, with all that said and done, I know there's tremendous needs out there. But if God expected us to meet all those needs, he would have given us the resources to do it with. If he thought it was our job to... to to have a homeless shelter and, uh, and to provide a, a room and board for all the homeless people in Dinuba. He would have given us a few multimillionaires that had so much extra they needed to get rid of. And unless some of you have been living hidden lives, <laughs> I don't think it's our job. You all understand what I'm saying? He will equip us with what he wants us to do. And if he hasn't given us the equipment, it's because it's not our job. Boy, isn't that good revelation? Now, and let me go on in this talking about equipping. Here's what we can do. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So what we need is to get the word of God inside of us, and through the word of the Lord, he is going to reveal his will, he is going to reveal the things that we should do, and such as that. You're not wasting your time being in a Bible study on a Wednesday night. You're not wasting time. You are literally preparing yourself, equipping yourself, qualifying yourself so that God can use you in the means and the ways that he ought to. One of the reasons society is in such a bad uh, condition as it is is because they've taken Bibles out of school. They've taken prayer out of school. They've made it where they've laughed and mocked the things of Christianity and godly, godliness. And so they have removed the influence of godly things from America. The unfortunate thing is, is in doing so, they are removing the consciousness of a nation to do good works. And when you, when you create a vacuum, 
The law of uh, thermodynamics says that nature abhors a vacuum, and when you create one, if you pull out godliness, if you remove righteousness, evil is going to come and fill that spot. This is where we're at in America. The, the benefit of being a godly nation was they were sitting in churches, taught the word of God, taught how to live good lives, do good works, and we had a nation that had that kind of spirit and attitude in our core nature. God, give us revival. We don't need more laws. We need more righteousness. Amen. All right, so it thoroughly furnishes us unto every good work. And then we have an obligation to one another. Somebody say amen. amen. We've got to help one another accomplish that purpose. Uh, I cannot tell you how many times I've experienced, either personally or watching others, a young person come up with a dream, a vision, something that they feel like God wants them to do, and watch other people pour cold water on their hot fire. That should never be. We need to be encouragers and not discouragers. Hebrews 10 and verse 24, let us consider one another to provoke and the word provoke there, we normally see it with a negative connotation, as in a little brother that pokes his big sister and provokes her, a child that bugs mama until she finally screams at him. Don't shout me down just because I'm preaching good. But you all know what I'm talking about. That's what we usually think when we use the word provoke. But when this use is you're provoked unto love, and to good works. This literally means encourage them unto good works. Encourage them that their love can be manifest and, and utilized and make known. Now, there's a lot more things that we could say about good works, and, uh, but tonight's not just about this, but it's just part of the topic as we go through this. But interesting enough is to every one of the seven churches in the book of Revelations, he says to them, I know thy works. That could either be good works or evil works. But he says, I know your works. We have a God in heaven that keeps an account. He keeps a score. And he knows what's going on at the Calvary Apostolic Church in Dinuba, California. He knows what I'm responsible for. He knows what you precious people are responsible for. And he knows whether we're doing our job or not. And so let's, let's make sure we do it. Good works are important. It is a part of our Christian walk. And here's the reason why. We are on public display. We don't live in a lifestyle that just fits in with all the rest of them. We are not, we are not uh, sheep in wolves' clothing. Well, that's a turn on it, you know, because it's usually wolves in sheep's clothing. But we don't go out and disguise ourselves or, or just emulate everything that they do. When we live the way we live, they can pick us out. They know who we are. We are on public display. And so Paul is saying, show yourself as a pattern. You need to be something that they can look at and model their lives after. They see your testimony. They hear your testimony. And it gives them hope they don't have to be what they've always been. They see you break habits. They see if you walk away from some things. And they think if he can do it, I can do it. Oh, somebody help me. I feel this. I believe it in Jesus' name. Because we need to be a living testimony to this world that there is a greater way, there's a better life. They don't have to live in the things that they're in. But there is a life where you can live and enjoy the presence of God and have a hope of what God has for us after this is all over with. We're going to provide an example of what this world is needs to live up to. Now, Paul is talking to Titus. He is saying, you have a responsibility. And those you're going to teach as bishops, as, as elders, 
they're going to have to do this. But I've already told you, the reason why Paul is putting him on the spot is because he's got to be an example for them. And if they're going to be that example that he has, he has led them in, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. It's so that you can be an example to this world. Amen. Now, he goes on and says that we're going to be an example in doctrine showing uncorruptness. It is an unfortunate thing that human philosophy makes its way into the circles of the church. That's what happens when you have a carnal church or an unconverted church. A church in name only, but not in experience. Thank God for this Pentecostal experience because it changed us. We're not doing this out of theory. We're doing it because we have an experience with God. So we, we have this. Uh, one thing that, is, that has happened, I've referred to it before, uh, it wasn't A.T. Morgan, it was the man that followed him, Brother Stanley Chambers. Uh, at a general conference a few years back, I say a few years, probably been at least 50 years back, preached a message about will the United Pentecostal Church survive the third generation? Because statistically, what they had watched through the years is after a church had been organized and involved, uh, uh, incorporated and all that kind of stuff, become a movement, that after 50 years or three generations, the fervor of that church began to wane. The concepts of that church began to change. They began to adapt the culture of the world to become more relevant. And after 50 years, that church was a shell of what it used to be. And the pro question he proposed is, will the United Pentecostal Church survive the onslaught of that kind of a thing? And the beautiful fact of the matter is, we have changed the course of that par paradigm. We're no longer demand, uh, are forced by it, but this church has survived that and we have gone on. What is the difference? What keeps them in this when they are leaving mainstream organizations by the droves? I'll tell you what it is. It is because this church has an experience where you are born again into the body through repentance, baptism, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. You don't get into this church because of who your mama and daddy are. You don't get into this because of your family was always a part. You get into this because you have a personal experience with God. And I'll tell you, when the fire of the Holy Ghost gets in you, it will change you. It is the new convert spirit that has kept the United Pentecostal Church what it is. And I want to join that with one other thing, and that is the level of holiness and commitment that the United Pentecostal Church has had. If we maintain those things, we can keep the corruption out of the pulpit. There is an absolute need to stay true to the Word of God. Paul said this to Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. Approved. That's a powerful word. When you realize you need God's blessing and His approval. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Somebody say that with me. Rightly dividing the word of truth. The reason you need to have that so passionately in your spirit is because you can take the word of God, twist it and misapply it and make all kinds of ungodly things out of it. Justify all kinds of, of, of sad things. That is not the plan, the will, the desire of God. 
That's not what God intended. He intended for you to search out what is the right. God, what do you mean? I read so many commentaries that they are so far off of base. And the reason they're off base is because they never had the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And they're trying to define scriptural concepts without the Holy Spirit living inside of them. How can you get base things on the Spirit if you do not have the Spirit? So we, lend, we end up living uh, this kind of stuff. They taught me in speech and debate, you can take any statistic and make it say whatever you want it to say. We have a case of this uh, going on right now in a, in a uh, um, pull my coattail, okay? Tell me to stay off politics. There is, there is a, there's a political race going on. I don't remember what state it is. I don't remember. Well, one party against the other party. Is that vague enough? One party is accusing the other party of voting against a certain situation, a certain bill. And so this other man is getting up saying, he doesn't care about such and such situation. He, he would just as soon, and he just land blasts him. He doesn't take into consideration that what the original politician was against was not the concept, but the bill. The bill was bad. He wasn't against the concept because they came out with a later bill, a newer bill, and he supported that bill, and it passed. But the man is going to something else, pulling out what he wants, ignoring a part of it, and putting it out there in his message. That's exactly what the old devil does is because he wants to pull away what he wants, make you look bad, make the church look bad, make all that kind of stuff look bad, and so that he can put his own spin on it and try to destroy the things of righteousness. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. But let me tell you something, friend. If we just live godly lives, God's going to take care of it in the end, and the truth is going to be revealed. Just keep rightly dividing the word of truth. Now let me read you this because it's very important. Ephesians 4 and 14, that we henceforth be no more children. God expects you to grow up, mature in God, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. I am not going to follow every little faddish concept that comes out on the internet. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to go chasing down chimney corner scriptures. Anybody know what that means? Something that's in there barely. So I'm not going to chase down something and try to make it and spiritualize it into something it was never intended to be. Why? Because I've got a, I've got a responsibility to stay with the book teach doctrine that is uncorruptible, teach doctrine that I can back up out of the Word of God, support out of the Word of God, and if it cannot be supported out of the Word of God, don't follow it. Somebody shout amen. Now let me move on. I'm feeling good tonight. Gravity and sincerity are the next two words that he uses in this verse. And, uh, and we can safely say, that what he's talking about here, what he's dealing with, is he is relating to the teaching of doctrine or the teaching of the word. It is not an admonition against laughter. It is not, he does not say that we got to act like a bunch of sad sacks. Although I look out sometimes and I wonder if you got baptized in lemon juice because you look like an old sour pickle. You know, it ought to be the joy of the Lord. Uh, I've got a scripture that I screened out, I could have used tonight, that talked about literally they looked at them and saw their joy, and, uh, and, or their laughter. The word is laughter there. But, uh, but when they see us, they ought to see a people that love living like they live, that, that it is good. And, and I like to laugh at church. I do. I, I, I think it's healthy. I especially like it when, when, when people are just having such deep moves of God that all of a sudden something strikes them funny and it just, y'all know what I'm talking about. It's happened and it'll happen again. 
The scripture does say that a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. So there is that positive aspect of it. God, God would not have made us with a sense of humor if that humor was something bad. I believe that God looked out there and made some of you just to make others laugh. But anyway, I'm kidding. But what it speaks to here when it talks about gravity and sincerity is our approach to how uh, to the spoken word, how we deal with it, the kind of respect that we that we uh, treat it with. I remember, I remember back in Bible school, having having days where we did uh, plays, skits, you know, just some fun stuff, and some of them trying to prepare a skit for for that event, uh, they would want to have a thing where they shouted like different ones and everybody laughed how they shouted and, and they'd want to basically have a mock church service and every, everything be funny. Well, that always made me sick. I, I couldn't stand the idea of mocking anything that God meant for, for, for good. I, I just, I've never wanted to go there. Um, I just, I'm not comfortable with it because there's some things that I, they might look hilarious while they're doing it, but they're doing it out of the purity of their heart and they should never be mocked for it, find out they got mocked for it, feel insecure because of it, and quit doing it. I'd hate to be guilty of something like that. Hello? Y'all understand what I'm saying? There's some things that are too holy to make a game out of. And when he talked about gravity and sincerity, he's talking about our approach to the Word of God, the things of God. We don't do it to make it all a big joke. It's not that we can't tell jokes, not that we can't be humorous. But when it comes to this book, we don't make a mockery out of this book. Now, I told this to uh, a couple the other day, and it, of course that's the reason it's on my mind. But... Uh, I had a young man that I brought in to another church that I pastored, and we had a fairly large group of uh, young people at that time, somewhere between the age of 14 and, and 25, and a large group of unmarried in the, it, it would just been, a, it was a great group to have at a youth group. But I knew the Lord spoke to me, and I knew that I had to do some teaching on uh, relationships and uh, before the enemy tried to get in there and make something that was healthy and good make it an ungodly coupling hello somebody so I brought a young man in and his primary job was on Sunday morning teach a class to that group called worth the weight worth the weight was a or still is out there but it is an abstinence program taught to our young people that your marriage relationships, your sexual relationships, are worth waiting to be under the bonds of marriage the way God intended for them to, do, to be. And uh, you don't have to worry about a lot of the junk that is going on if you'll just be pure and godly and right. You won't have to worry about AIDS. You won't have to worry about monkey pox. Hello, you won't have to worry about all that kind of stuff if you live godly, clean lives. And, uh, and so what I found out afterwards was while I am trusting this young man to communicate a godly message to my young people, the manner and the way that he communicated it was with funny little facial things, tones of voice, everything else that communicated that while he's saying it's worth the wait, he didn't really believe it was worth the wait. You all understand what I'm saying? And it under, undermined the very intention of what I was trying to do. Now I'm saying that because how you approach a sacred subject can be very, very important to the outcome of how that message is received. And we've got, we've got an obligation 
to make sure that we treat it holy and right. And somebody say amen. Now, it talks about sound speech and that that sound speech cannot be condemned. The word sound speech means wholesome, beneficial. And I, I want to deduce out of this that it also means reasonably educated. I can tell when a man is in the pulpit whether he is a reader or not. I can tell by the manner that he communicates, the phrases that he uses, the illustrations that he brings out. And I'm not just talking about what he copied out of a book somewhere, but I'm talking about those things and the way that he, he communicates it. I can tell by his sentence structure. It's not that we don't all slaughter the king's English somewhat, but it doesn't give us a right to go out there and just maul it intentionally. Somebody say amen. And so when you're in this pulpit, I know this is for a select few. Uh, not everybody gets up here, but for those that do, you know, like, like Sister Laura. Why did I slip that in there? Here's some things to avoid. Avoid trite language. There's a lot of Christian words out there that are nothing more than empty buzzwords that really are not saying a thing. It's just the thing to say. Some of that needs to be avoided and taken care of. Uh, you, you need to avoid repetitive filler words. Hallelujah, hallelujah, amen, amen. Saying them 222 times. I was thinking of a number and I thought, well, if I'm talking about repetitive, two, 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 I might as well. Just the things that, that you just throw in there and all you're doing is taking a mental breath because it's really not used as worship. You're just throwing them in there. Double negatives. Now there's a song that we have used to sing a whole lot and it irritates me every time we sing it and I rewrite it in my mind every time we sing it. What is it? Hey, can't nobody do me like Jesus? No, that's not it. Whatever it is, it's down there near the end of the of the of the chorus, and I, I get to that, and I rewrite it all the time because it's bad grammar, and it don't make sense. Don't never make sense. All right, that one was intentional. All right, let's get off my hobby horse and let's move on. And then the scripture says that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed. There are people out there that are watching every move we make to criticize, destroy, and all the rest of that. We had somebody trying to join our, our public Facebook group the other day, and they didn't want to get to hear the messages. They just wanted to criticize. That's all, it's all they wanted, and so they didn't get to. But he said that they may be ashamed, having no evil uh, thing to say of you. Now here's the truth, folks. They're going to do it. But you don't need to give them any reason to disdain you. You don't need to validate their ideas concerning us. They're going to twist our words, just like the media has for us. They're going to pull them out of context in order to slander us, to say all kinds of things about us. But we cannot afford to just set ourselves up in order to be treated that way. So he said, he said, you need to keep sound words. You need to make sure that you do it in a way that uh, removes the criticism. Paul is going to say this later in, in the book of Titus. He says it to Timothy, but he told Timothy to, to not give them any reason to... Um, something there, his youth. To dis, not disdain the youth, but despise. Don't let anybody despise your youth. Now the fact is, folks, if you're a young people, young person, you can't do a whole lot about other people's opinions. Okay? They're going to do what they're going to do. But you don't have to give them a reason to do it. And that is the bottom line. Now from there, we're going to go into another uh, section the next two verses go into another thought, so I, I want to stop it right there. And, uh, and I've covered 
well over half an hour just as it is. And so I think we've, we've said enough for tonight. But um, one of these days, everything about this book is going to be clear to us. And the more we study, the more beauty we see in it, the more we see how th the threads connect and see how it all fits together. And uh, it is a beautiful thing, the wisdom of the Word of God. Oh, the depths of the riches of God. Amen. Let's stand together and let's love the Lord one more time. Thank Him for the Word. Thank Him for the privilege to study. Thank Him for the freedom in America that we have to study the Word of God, the access, the freedom of worship. Just come on out of your heart with your own language, with your own words, would you just thank the Lord together tonight? I bless you, Jesus. I bless you and I glorify you. You are great and greatly to be praised, worthy of worship, worthy of honor, worthy of praise. We glorify you, Jesus, in Jesus' name.